Today's guest is a leader in the tech industry. Her book has been translated into nine different languages. She is a thought leader on social media and a huge influencer and one of my favorite role models. Stay tuned all the way to the end of this discussion because she gives some powerful hacks I've never heard before of how to make sure you get heard in virtual meetings. I am so excited to have Tiffany Bova as my guest today, and she's got fans all over. I'm sure you've heard of her before, a uh, senior executive at Salesforce. And Tiffany, as an homage to you, I'm going to start this podcast the way you start your podcast, with yep. bullish or bearish. Oh, boy. I, I get it. Yeah, you're, in, you're on the reverse. You're in the hot seat now. All right, okay. I'm ready. Genetic modifications of humans, bullish or bearish? I'd say for uh, bearish, if you're trying to create designer children, but bullish, if it is really about, you know, health and, and the health of the mother or the baby, then, then maybe I, I, I would lean that way. But just to create the perfect, whatever you think is perfect, I, I am bearish. You're not for it. You're not for no. it. Okay. Um, social media, polarization and intensity of, of social media, bullish or bearish? Uh, I am um, bullish on the fact that it is polarizing <laughs> for sure, but I also feel like it's super educational. So I, you know, I'm looking forward to finding this balance between where it is at the moment and where I think it can be. So, and you're so active in social media. So hopefully you will be able to lead us to a better, stronger <laughs> place in social media. Um, how about this one? So AI, artificial intelligence, will support women's leadership. And you and I have gone around this AI thing and, and, and uh, how it affects different audiences, diverse audiences. So I'm going to put it out there, bullish or bearish on AI actually being good for women's leadership. I'm bullish. Okay. Tell me a little more. Uh, because I think that, uh, you know, AI is now has, should have a seat at the board table and the executive meetings and, uh, you know, leadership teams should be looking at AI to be another voice that maybe is looking across, you know, what's actually happening on things like equality or how many women or how many have we hired or how many are in the pipeline? Like, do you want humans to try and track all that? Or do you oh, want AI to really okay. use the capabilities in a positive way? It took me a minute, but I got what you're saying is we really should be leveraging AI to make sure that women can move up. Love that answer because AI can sometimes be uh, loaded so that like, like the example of uh, there was a hiring, uh, a company that was hiring and it was and the AI was weeding out all the women's resumes, you know, so AI has worked against women in some ways, but you're saying we should harness it and make it work for women. Great. Make it work for, to give people opportunity, period, right? It's not just women. It's just giving everybody sort of opportunity. The only challenge with AI is you can create bias in the AI. Right, right. Uh, and so that has bearing on its ability to do what we aspire for it to do if there's bias written into it in the first place. Right, exactly. So we got to weed out some of the bias, but but I love your answer, which is saying just focus the AI on looking at women's opportunities, and then yes. uh, then yes. it'll it'll help us. Great. Okay, so your book Growth IQ is fabulous, and I was looking at it in terms of the topic of this podcast is women and minorities rising into leadership. And Growth IQ, your book is really focused on how do companies grow. And so I wanted to see where's the intersection in, you know, how do companies grow and harnessing diverse leadership? How does that help companies grow? So I want to go straight to number 10 on your list. All right. The 10th Let's item go. on 10, unconventional strategies is one of the ways that companies grow and disrupting current thinking. So having diverse, diverse ethnically diverse gender leaders, doesn't that help us disrupt our current thinking? Yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start kind of at the beginning and, and think about how leaders are always at this crossroad. Do we go back to the status quo or do we take this opportunity, whatever that opportunity is, and decide to try to do things differently? And it's different for different companies, but if companies are growing, it's really hard to get them to say, 
what you're doing will no longer work because they're like, yeah, I'm growing. Come show up back to me when I'm not growing anymore. So you have that for, sort of- I worked for IBM, which is one of the cautionary tales in your book, right? And, yeah, I, and got to, I got to live through that. Yeah, and Ginny Rometty is one of the opening quotes in my book that says growth and comfort never coexist. You, you know, you have to get very comfortable with being uncomfortable. And personal disruption is the first step in actually creating some kind of corporate disruption, right? Because if you think about things the same way and you always do it the same way, or you won't try something because you tried it years ago and it failed, then your inability to have this beginner's mind holds you back from what opportunity may be open to you if you had a more diverse leadership team or a, you know, a more diverse selling team or whatever it might be. But ultimately, this is uh, that opportunity is, is really when you start thinking about giving yourself space to try things that you might not have tried historically and doing it for reasons that really match the values of your company, of your brand, and of you as a personal you know, leader, uh, that's really where the power of those things come together is when you're willing to disrupt yourself and try things yourself. It sets the example for others that, okay, like it's not that scary, I'm gonna give it a try. And if I'm supported and I, it's trusted, then, then I'm more willing to, to give it a shot. Uh, Jim Hackett, I was talking to, uh, who, who just stepped down as CEO at Ford, and he said, he said, I put more women on my senior leadership teams because they tended to disrupt the thinking and disrupt the conversation and same old business as usual. Uh, and, and so I intentionally did that because it changed the conversation. I thought that was so neat that I never heard anyone just say that, you know, I put women on because they slow down the conversation and ask too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so in the 10 paths to growth, are there other areas where diversity is really important? I mean, when you think about customer experience, um, customer base penetration too, a lot, of, a lot of the things you talk about in your book, having more diverse leaders is going to help you do the, those creative things. Yeah, and then I think it's, it's interesting because I, like you, I, I, I try to share content that I find that kind of validates this conversation. Why it's important to even think about diversity in leadership or in your product development team or in your selling engine, whatever, whatever you're responsible for. And I'm always fascinated by the responses I get. And I don't even have to respond. Like if someone responds, someone jumps right in and has, and I just watch the conversation happen, right? I kind of tee it up, if you will. And it's interesting how uh, sometimes people don't understand the value and why it's even important. And I was reminded many years ago that try to have your company represent who your customers are. Do your employees look like your customers? So let's just pick women, discretionary funds. They spend some 60% of all the discretionary funds. And in certain categories, they make 85 or 90% of the decisions in a household. And then you don't have any women on the team that is designing the products that you're selling to the predominant consumer of that product. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And you'll see that that's where the disconnect really happens because you're not even in tune with who that customer is. Uh, and so many of us have probably tried a product and you go, did the person who designed this actually ever use it? Because it doesn't actually work the way, you know, or that messaging really fell flat. And if you inauthentically go after that particular audience without some kind of um, credibility behind it, the market knows it right away now. There's sort of so much ability without transparency to see those two things, the sort of develop and then matching who the customer is. That's a great way to start the conversation when you get resistance. Like I don't need more women on my leadership team or I don't need more women in my product development or in my you know, call center. And I, I just stop and say, okay, do you happen to know the demographic of your buyer? Who's your, who's your prospective customer? And then I start peeling the layers back and they kind of get to the point I'm trying to make on their own. So that, that's a great way to turn the conversation on its head where you just don't come right out and say, the best thing for you to do is diversify, you know, who your leadership team well, is because people will push back. It's interesting too, when I think about growth IQ, it could be that your current customer base is, is women. So you should have more women in leadership, but it could also be that that's your growth opportunity, right? If you don't have Absolutely. It in your customer base, maybe you should, right? Yeah, one of the stories I do in the book is Lemonade Insurance. And they were very, very small when I wrote the book. And now since they've gone public and they're doing amazingly well. But one of the things was interesting was they were trying to really disrupt the, you know, very legacy 
uh, male dominated uh, insurance industry that's sort of done it the same way for a hundred years, right? And they said, no, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna do this a little bit differently. We're gonna make it very easy. We're gonna make it very mobile. We're not gonna do contracts the way you normally do. We're gonna do video contracts where wow. the person actually has to look and like say, I will not do false claims. And you know, and so now you have this personal relationship. And oh, by the way, you have a choice to pick, I think it's five or seven um, not-for-profits. And you can pick which one you want to align with. And so what they end up doing is putting you in groups of like-minded people who want to participate in those not-for-profits. At the end of the year, when everything's done, a percentage of the profit in that particular bucket, a category of customers is donated to that particular not-for-profit. So now what they've done is they all of a sudden found themselves with significantly more female customers than any other insurance agency in the United States. Many more millennials, first time buyers of insurance who were afraid of insurance before and now they were able to attract them. The CEO actually said this was accidental. It was not actually our plan. We aspired to do it. We didn't know what we were doing was actually going to be that secret sauce right. to get more women to come on, to get more millennials to come on. So I just used that as an example. And that was not, we want to be the insurance agency for women or millennials. That's not what they said. They said, let's provide a product and service that will attract them, that attracts right. them to what we're doing. And it tended to be more women and, my, and uh, millennials. Well, and when you say more millennials too, isn't that the holy grail of advertising is you want to get them young and keep them for the rest of their lives, right? And so that's, that's uh, it's, it's one of those things where they're doing the thing because it was interesting or for an interesting reason, but they ended up with really powerful results. Really powerful results. And, uh, you know, and, and it was also, uh, you know, a way for them to con continuously learn. They were very transparent. It was a way to give back. And the, the path that you just talked about, unconventional strategies, was all about purpose over profit. And that was one of the examples that, that, I, that I used. So, Gosh, there's so many things I want to talk about, about women in leadership in tech. And you've been such a champion, too. I'm sure you have a lot of, of mentees and uh, people that you sponsor and advocate for. What do you see as some of the critical issues for women rising in tech, for women rising into leadership in tech? I've now been in technology for, uh, well, since I was 25 and I am 54. So No, you are not. <laughs> I am. I feel like 54 today, that's for sure. But... 54. So from 25 to 54 and 25, I, you know, didn't know anything, but for sure from 25 to about 38 or 39, I was one of the only women I have ever seen sort of selling technology. And that worked to my advantage um, because they would remember who I was, but very early on in my career, uh, actually one of my very first bosses, you know, I, I, I walked in and it was time for me to interview and he, you know, we finished the interview and he goes, I absolutely want to hire you. But then I went, oh, here it comes, right? But, and so this had to be 1996-ish, 96, 97. So now people are going to go look at my LinkedIn profile and see where it was, but 96, 97. And he said, but I don't believe anybody will buy technology and especially this you know, million dollar technology solutions from someone named Tiffany. So we're going to have to give you another name. I was like, what? <laughs> And I don't know if I necessarily disagreed with him, but really, you know, at the end of the day, I was like, wow, like that's my name. So he said, you know, what's your middle name? So I told him my middle name. He said, okay, well, let's go with that. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it was the very first meeting, but here I was, right? In tech, very first interview, kind of very first real sort of serious job in the industry. And the owner of the business, the CEO, the hiring leader tells me no one is going to buy tech from somebody named Tiffany. You need to change your name. You need to change your name. So we were in our very first meeting, uh, you know, together. And he was saying my, you know, not my name across the table. I'm not turning around because obviously, <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, not my name. So then he said, Tiffany, and I turned around, right? Needless to say, you know, he was a probably $200,000 a month business. And by the time I left, he was a million and a half. And I wasn't even there a year. So I was like, I guess people, right, will buy from, from somebody, somebody named Tiffany. 
but what it ended up doing was it sort of set me up. So I oh, don't ever feel number one, like I got a job because I was a woman and I never felt like I didn't get a job because I was a woman. Now I may be completely naive to that reality, but I never felt it, which maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. I didn't have that experience. Um, but I just sort of kept my head down and did really good work and really good work. Uh, and so back to your question about sort of champions, I call them kind of champions and mentors. Um, I stand on the shoulders of so many who came before me and I made it a point to meet them and introduce myself and follow what they did. And back then the web was not what it is. You can't follow everybody on social media. It wasn't podcasts and we didn't have, you know, iPhones with the power of everything in our hand. You had to do the old fashioned communication, like a phone call or you'd see them at a conference. Uh, but those moments in time where they would give me five minutes or 10 minutes completely changed the trajectory of my career. And so, you know, I always take a moment when I see them or I see they're doing something or I get an opportunity to once again sort of remind them of how important they were to my career because that's what it's all about. So people pulled you forward and you pull people forward as well. Yeah, it, it, was, I, it was, it was, I like to say that I was in consumption mode. Like in my 20s, I didn't know what I wanted to do. In my 30s, it was all about work, more power, more control, more title, more money, right? It was more, more, more sort of consumption. In my 40s, I was really tired. And then in my 50s, I'm, I really made a conscious decision to be much more in contribution mode, right? How can I sort of give back and, and pay it forward for, you know, sort of the, the thanks of an industry that's been so good to me? Confidence is a big issue. And there's been a lot documented about that, about uh, women don't always have as much confidence as men. And I actually, we did a, a research study in for, on women in tech and there was a huge gap in confidence between men and women. And men are really confident that they're gonna succeed and they're gonna get ahead. And uh, the majority of women was, was unsure or pessimistic about whether they were really gonna be able to rise into leadership in tech. So what do you, what do you say to your mentees or people that you're sponsoring about uh, confidence? How do you help them to become more confident? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you naturally had a lot of confidence, but not everybody does. But, you know, I wouldn't say I naturally had it. You know, I, I learned how to have confidence young from sports. And I think there's a lot to be said. There was some stats out about how many female leaders, you know, CEOs and leaders are ex-athletes and not at, to the level of Bonnie St. John sort of, you know, breaking barriers and competing in the Olympics. But, you know, it could be your high school team or your, you know, your company team or a local league, whatever it might be. But sports really helped me be more confident when maybe I wasn't right. Play a position you don't know. Play a sport you're not very good at. You're really good at one sport. You're terrible at another sport. Like, you know, I, I might be able to beat Bonnie St. John at one sport. But if we go skiing, I'll just sit at the bar. <laughs> like, you know, so you kind of got to pick your battles. On, on where you want to compete. And so that, that's sort of where I got the confidence. But I think that women are um, nervous uh, at being um, shut down when they start to try to find their voice. They're ignored, they're talked over, um, or they're not, you know, the, the comments are not appreciated, or they say something and then a guy says the same thing five minutes later and they take the credit for it. And that is really the responsibility of leaders being much more aware that if you have a diverse team, that you give everybody moments and time in which their voice can be heard. And if more and more women see that it's safe to do that, they'll start to build the confidence. And then even if they get shut down, the world doesn't end for them. You know, and, and uh, I used to give this presentation called Co Building Your Confidence Muscle. And I said, it's very much like going to the gym. You know, the first month or two, you're really sore. <laughs> Or you pick up a sport and you're not very good. But over time, you know, you get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then you start focusing on another part of your body. And then you're sore all over again. And then you get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so you don't just go from, you know, never talking at a meeting to, you know, running your own meeting. And for, it, it just doesn't happen like that for you anyone. Build you know? that muscle. I love, I get this huge smile, Tiffany, because I actually wrote the same thing. Confidence is a muscle in the book I wrote, Live Your Joy. And, and uh, I, was, I was quoting um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first woman uh, president in, of a country in Africa. And she talked about exactly that, about how she built her confidence muscle over time and that you, you don't just get to do it overnight. Another thing, and I'd love to hear your comment on this too, is 
uh, some people talk about confidence, like if I use the right words, you know, if I didn't use uh, words that equivocate or if I dress right or should I wear my hair a certain way, you know, like what are all the things I could change about myself so I can show up stronger? And I, you know, there's certainly there's some things to look at there, but I often say, you know, if you have sponsors, if you have people advocating for you, and that can be as simple as if you know you have to go into a meeting where you're going to be sharing your ideas, talk to somebody ahead of time, male or female, and say, hey, I'm going to share a new idea. Can you back me up when I share that? Or, you know, or when the when the other guy says your idea 10 minutes later, can that person jump in and go, hey, I'm glad you agree with Tiffany, you know? And, and so having advocates either in the room or in your career, that makes such a difference. You don't have to do it alone. It's not just your hairstyle that's going to determine your confidence. It's, it's your allies. Can you, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. And I would say always dress for success, like whatever <laughs> success is for you, because it isn't about not only how comfortable you are or what you think, but unfortunately there is still the perception and the bias of what people think about how it's like being late to a meeting. What does that say to people about, do you respect their time? I love your ombre hair. I have to say, I've been meaning to say that. I love the ombre hair. And again, you're in tech, so you can do ombre hair. If you're in a really conservative, you know, 200 year old financial company, the ombre hair might not quite be dressed for success, right? Yeah, and, and, and I don't know what I do because it kind of is what it is, but. <laughs> I love it. But it's, but again, it's context. The dress for success is context. So that's it's context, it. right? And so when I'm on stage, I'm always in a suit, you know, uh, and, and I actually had neck surgery and I had to stop wearing heels and wearing like Adidas, right? And so I'm like, well, if I'm going to wear tennis shoes, you know, or sneakers, nope. might as well wear really cool ones. No and one so, can tell on Zoom though. <laughs> yeah, well, I am standing up, but you can't tell on Zoom. But um, uh, I would say this, you know, I learned early on about the confidence muscle and you just gave this example, Bonnie, where someone would say, Hey, did you hear what Tiffany said? Or they pull you in or they backed you up. If somebody asks you for that, they are flexing their confidence muscle. And if you shut them down and let's just hypothetically say it's the very first time they've ever asked somebody to back them up and you shut them down, they may never ask someone again. And so you have to take those kinds of requests to heart. And you have to realize that how you respond has an impact on what that person may do next or again, or the next time. And so I use uh, when sometimes when I'll get off stage, someone will come up and they'll say something, you know, I might not have any time, but if I shut them down right away, they may never walk up to someone again and ask them a question. So even if I take 10 seconds and say, I don't have any time right now, drop me a note on LinkedIn or something and, and I'll get back to you. You know, it, it gives, I always thought because people did that when I walked up to them. And I also remember those times where someone would shut me right down. And if I had not had the confidence I had, I might never have asked again. It would have been game over. Yeah. With this podcast, I really want to focus on pouring into that person who was you earlier in your career. So you just gave advice to leaders saying, hey, give that person a chance, do that. But what's your advice to the person who did get shut down, who, who asked for help and didn't get it? What's your, what, how would you inspire them to keep going? Yeah, look, I, you know, I, I have been, I, I'd asked early in my career and got shut down. I mean, I have some fun stories. And whenever I see those executives, I still remind them of those great stories of when they shut me down. But, and we do it more fun now because we're friends. But back then I was devastated, you know, like, oh my gosh, like, what am I going to do? And it, it goes back to had I not had some sense of confidence, I, it might have just completely destroyed me. Now, what I did do was say, okay, that probably did not work. Like that approach, was I too aggressive? Did I, was I too, you know, comfortable? Did I make it seem kind of awkward? Like, so I really started to work on my approach. And, and I said, it isn't just me. It's also them. I only can right. control yeah. myself. Sometimes it's just next. Sometimes it's just ask the next person, right? That that's wasn't right. the right time or the right day for that person. That's right. And so what can you take away from it? And so that's hard when you're in the thick of it to realize that you have to trust the process and trust your journey. And it's not always going to be yes. And it's not always going to be gold medals, you know, and you're never going to be an overnight success. It's going to be trials and tribulations and wins. And, and, and I don't say win and loss. I say win and learn, right. It's going to be learning opportunities and you will just move through. Now, is it hard? Is it deflating? Do you feel like no one's on your side and you just can't get anything right? Yes. And I mean, I still feel it today. This far into my career, there are days where I go, wow, I am over my head. 
I'm over my skis. You know, I'm way ahead of where I need to be. So, you know, it's not that it goes away. If you're not getting nervous, if you're not uncomfortable, if you're not scared about doing something, then you're not challenging yourself to try new stuff. Because if you're just comfortable all the time, how boring is that? We were talking about the confidence code and I was backstage at, uh, this is where we met backstage at some conference. Uh, I was backstage with Claire Shipman, one of the authors of that. And she was talking about how perfectionism is a form of lack of confidence. And I'd never thought of that connection before. I thought that was so interesting is that sometimes women try to be so perfectionist because we're trying to be confident. So if I get everything right, I can be confident, you know, and what you're saying is, no, you're not going to get everything right. You know, just you, you, you need to be able to be confident and, and keep going, get better, get better, but you're never going to get everything perfect. And that, that perfection can be the enemy of confidence. Yeah, and then you can get into the whole imposter syndrome conversation, right? Where men will say, I have 50% of the skills, I'm going to go for the job. And women say, I have to have 100% of the skills to go for the same job. Um, and so the perfection, uh, sort of the perfectionism may also be because if it isn't perfect, then I'm going to get judged or I'm going to be embarrassed or I'm going to be humiliated or people are going to call me out that it wasn't right or correct. Uh, and that goes back to, um, you know, do you have the right set of leaders? Are you surrounded with the right set of people that even when you do make mistakes, they're, they're there to help you sort of stand back up and dust you off. And sometimes you can do it on your own. Like you can just pick yourself up and go, I got this. And other times, you know, you really need others to sort of help you. But if you are, you know, if you are early in your career, um, know that everybody has been in the same situation as you. Exactly. <laughs> like you exactly. are not alone. Any, any particular advice about multicultural women uh, uh, in this time? And I know we've had the Black Lives Matter movement and there's a lot going on with that. I don't, I don't know how involved you've been with that. We do a lot of work specifically for multicultural women too. Uh, I, I don't know if you, if you have any stories to tell or any insights on that. So this has been, a, it, the entire Black Lives Matter movement has been a very interesting journey for myself. Um, you know, obviously I'm a Caucasian white woman. I was born and raised in, in Hawaii. So you could argue that it's the 50th state, but, um, being born and raised in Hawaii, I was the minority. It is very much a Pacific rim melting pot, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Samoa, Tonga, Guam, and then me, you, you were the Howley. I was the Howley and it was <laughs> kindergarten. I brought my mom to show and tell. That's a particularly Hawaiian slur, right? It is a Hawaiian slur. Haole means basically Caucasian, you know? So, um, you know, and, and so you could sort of take it tongue in cheek or be offended by it. But I always laugh when someone says it to me because I was born and raised there. So I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, just don't let the color of my skin fool you. But, but um, I would say that I didn't actually understand racism in that way. Um, and I remember I was in kindergarten. I brought my mom to school for show and tell because my mom has dark hair, dark eyes and olive skin because I'm Italian and I'm almost pure Italian. So I'm just I look like my parents. I'm just not as uh, uh, olive as my parents. I'm, I'm definitely the fair version of them. And so it taught me a lot about culture, about I felt like I didn't fit in. You know, I didn't, there wasn't a lot of African-Americans and Latinos in Hawaii unless they were in the military. So I didn't even experience that kind of sort of uh, definition until I came to the mainland to go to college. And then I was very confused. I was very confused by it. I didn't understand it. But then Black Lives Matter happened and I realized how uneducated I was about the entire plight, like how to be anti-racist or, you know, that's very different. And it's, it's, so it has been, um, Salesforce has been masterful at helping educate all of us. If you want to be you know, educated and attend little webinars and take classes and have conversations and how do you have these conversations where you don't feel like you know, it isn't gonna be well received, words matter, how you act matters. And, and I can say that it's been a journey for me that I didn't actually know I needed to go on until I went on it and I realized, wow, I still had a, a lot to learn. So it's been a really interesting time for me. Salesforce is, uh, is and, and your CEO is one of, the, one of my heroes for having come out and said, we're gonna e have equal pay for men and women and just we're gonna do it. And how many years ago? That was like years ago that they said, okay. hey, we're just gonna equalize it. 
Yeah, and so it was four or five years ago, and the first time it was a it was a, about a three million dollar shortage uh, in the U.S. between men, uh, men and women. And I'm making up the dates, but let's say he realized that. Well, first of all, he didn't believe it was true. So two women executives did the research, came back, and told him it's true. Everybody else is wringing their hands and going, someday we'll have equal pay. We'll keep making progress and someday it will happen. And he said, well, this is ridiculous. We're changing it. He said, let's and just so fix it now. On the next paycheck, he shorted up $3 million, three or $4 million. And there were some, there were some men that had to be pulled up to, you know, he just, he did the analysis across and he's like, we're going to have equal pay. Well, the first year it was just women to men. The second year it was women to men again. And then we made big uh, uh, acquisitions. Then the third year we did it, we realized we almost, and I think that's about the time you and I met, we had overcorrected. So we actually had to well, no, show it up I, to I, I meant well. that there, there might, as you're looking around at, at unequal gender pay, there might be one man in one area who has lower pay, you know? And so you, you, he was just making it equal, right? And so yes. whichever way that goes, you, you make it equal. And right. I just loved, and that was such, I think that was a real inspiration to a lot of other companies too, to say, we don't have to say it'll be fixed someday. We can do the analysis and we can just fix it. Yeah, and we still have a lot of work to do on just, you know, the number of people of color and minorities, uh, you know, in executive roles and, and leading the company and leading divisions. And we still have work to do. And we're, we're definitely, as you mentioned, we have a CEO who is squarely committed to this, no question. Um, and it just takes time and it's never fast enough, right? But we've gotten much better on, you know, what's the applicant pool? Are we giving everybody the opportunity? It can't just be that we can't find them. That's that's a lazy excuse, right? It's you need to go in the colleges that they are, you know, create internships and onboarding programs, and also, by the way, make them feel comfortable to actually come and work in at, at Salesforce. Inclusion, it's, it's, yeah, is to yeah. have actual inclusion. And so you said you've you've learned a lot. And I remember talking to another uh, woman executive. She was actually Canadian, and she was in a, in a financial firm. And she said, "Gosh." Uh, when I started looking at this, like you said, you hadn't necessarily looked at it before you start looking at it. She goes, I realized I do so much to mentor women, but I hadn't made a point of mentoring multicultural women and they weren't necessarily coming to me. So I had to, to really reach out and build bridges. Is that something you've gotten more conscious of as well? Yeah. And, and like I said, I didn't think I had work to do until I had work to do. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a, a I, I naturally um, a, am very inclusive. Like I'm naturally very, because of where I didn't leave Hawaii till I was 30 full time. Wow. So like my life, I mean, born and raised, right? And so my view, I, I remember when I got one of my very first jobs, I was probably 21 years old and I was selling um, furniture for a large tower that was being built in Honolulu. And the majority of the market was uh, Japanese. The yen was very strong. American dollar was very weak. And back then we would literally send a VHS tape to Japan, they would pick the package that they wanted for the furniture for the condo they were be buying, by the way, sight unseen. So we had a group of investors come into, Cal uh, come into Hawaii to buy, and it was um, probably eight or nine uh, Japanese businessmen. I was the person that was selling it. Now this is in like 89 or 90, 1989, 1990 timeframe. I was the executive at the time. Now I'm 21. So when I say executive, like I was the only salesperson. So I was the one, right? I have to have this meeting face to face. Nope. I had to have a man in the room. I would have to say the message to the guy who would then say it to the audience or to the group of people. I had to sit furthest from the door because culturally whoever sits closest to the door is the most senior. So I had to hit sit furthest from the door and I had to have someone else basically say everything for me. So, you know, that was a cultural thing. Right. I was going to say, it's not just gender. There's so huge cultural issues in there and understanding unwritten rules and uh, lots of things. And so you have been building this muscle for a long time. I thought it was ridiculous when I was in the middle of it, but it culturally that's, I didn't take it as an affront. I'm like, and I will tell you, you know, like you, I get the opportunity normally to travel around the world. And you have to be very aware of the cultural differences. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, but they are in place because it is their culture, it is their country, it is how they do it. You might not agree with it, but you know, you have to respect it if that's where you're gonna go and travel. And so, you know, ultimately you really have to be aware that it is, it is also cultural differences. 
Well, this has been such a great conversation and you truly are a global leader. I saw that your book has been translated into how many languages now? Nine, nine languages. And last, uh, just recently it came out with um, the paperback in uh, the UK and Commonwealth. So now it's making its way. I had somebody share something with me the other day from Pakistan. She's like, I'm so excited I was able to get your book in Pakistan. I was like, that's amazing. Like how special is that? So great. That, That is great. And it just goes to show that all the things you're talking about growing up in Hawaii and learning sensitivity to different cultures. And that's, you know, enabled you to write a book that's so impactful globally. And, and, and has relevance across so many cultures. You're not just coming from one point of view. So truly an inclusive and impactful leader. It is an honor to talk about all these things with you. And I really appreciate your candor too. I'm sure you're gonna inspire not only women, but a lot of, of uh, aspiring leaders and, and people who are growing in their leadership to follow in your footsteps, take risks, uh, enlist advocacy, uh, really. you know, Can you give us any last tips about how do you enlist other people to help you in your career? How do you, how do you ask for that? So I have been, I have found for me that it happens organically. Whenever I've tried to force a mentorship either way, it hasn't always worked out for me. When I organically find that I connect with someone, do I need to say with, to them now, will you be my mentor? Or do I just embrace and enjoy the fact that they've been willing to give me time I'm respectful of that time. So I feel like I have amazing champions that I can tap into. And I call them my tribe, but I call them my orchestra. And that's the easiest way for me to describe that people in your lives play different instruments. But when you bring it all together, that's sort of the symphony of your life. So you have friends who are your drummers, right? They're they're banging, they're loud. You have people who are more subtle and maybe play the harp, right? Beautiful, quiet, in the corner, relaxes you when you spend time with them, right? And you might never mix the the things and the instruments. They don't all go together, right? They might all all go together. But when you think about it that way, that you very um, strategically or um, specifically or intentionally Set a conversation with somebody where you know that that is in their wheelhouse. And when you can establish that you respect time and you come to them and then you action it and you follow up. And by the way, you send a thank you note, which, uh, you know, I, I do whenever I get a chance. Those little things go a long way. Um, and I don't mean a thank you text and I don't mean a thank you email. I literally mean a piece of paper, a note, write it, put it in the mail, you know like we used to do. Um, it, it, it absolutely shows that you have a level of respect for those people. So I am a fan for the organic uh, sort of career advice and mentorship and championing and you know bouncing ideas off of more than the formality. Unless you're really going for career coaching and you're hiring a coach, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. That's and, a different and, I, thing. and there is a distinction between having a mentor and having a sponsor, right, too. So sometimes you're asking somebody to go to bat for you, too. Um, and you, you want to have a relationship there. You know what? One more thing. I keep saying one more thing. One more thing I want to get in here too is before we got on air, you were talking a little bit about uh, having some of those conversations of enlisting support in this time when we're all on Zoom. You know, and even after the uh, quarantine is over, hopefully when we all have shots and we're out of the pandemic, uh, you know, we'll still be using Zoom and, and all these things a lot. Uh, and and that can actually be helpful for women because it's it's easier to avoid some of the me too issues if you're not in a bar or if you're not even in person and it doesn't eliminate all of them. And you made that point, but, um, but, but that's an opportunity as well to be able to enlist advocacy without some of the pitfalls. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very valid point. And there's been some research out uh, over the last six or seven months around how women feel on zoom meetings. Do they feel less heard or more heard? Are they interrupted more or less? Do people, you know, even ask them to participate? And so, you know, when we well, I'm trying to hear the answer now, did women feel more included or less included? Less included. Uh. They feel less included, unfortunately. And and some of that is because you don't have that human interaction, right? And so sometimes, um, or they're, you know, it, it is still very awkward. If you have 15 people on, like, do you raise your hand? Do you just speak? You don't want to talk over other people. You know, it's still like Zoom etiquette is not the same. You can't. You miss subtleties in body language, if someone's leading in to say something, not everyone has their camera on. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that that's happening. Um, but, but 
I, I, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, I have a little bit of Zoom fatigue as well. Like, do I always have to be on camera? Like, you know, just to have a one-on-one -on -one call and does every meeting have to be 30 minutes or 60 minutes? And so, you know, if you're wor working your way through this, I would ask people, why have you invited me to the meeting? How can I add value? I'm happy to say yes, I'm happy to participate. I just wanna make sure I show up prepared or whatever. And then if you can add value and they tell you why you're there, then that's part of your confidence muscle flex, right? I actually have an opinion on this and I was invited to come. I'm not just somebody who accidentally showed up to some Zoom meeting to talk about a product launch. Like that's not, I'm here for a reason. And I think some of the things we talked about earlier still go in a virtual world, right? As we were talking about, if you can recruit some people to be your allies going into a meeting, so you know there's going to be important things discussed and you say, hey, you know, here's the views I'm going to present. Do you agree? Oh, maybe I can incorporate some of your view. And then they can be your ally in that meeting. So the meeting before the meeting can be important in a virtual world as well as a real world. During some Zoom meetings, I will chat directly to somebody and say, hey, I was thinking, do you think it's appropriate? You know, or it's the leader of the meeting. Hey, you know, I... I know that you wanted me to say this, just call me in when you're ready for me to say something, you know, where you're proactively saying, hey, I'm here. Um, you know, I was just want, on a Zoom meeting before we got together today and there was probably 20 people uh, and it gets a little tricky, right? Because everyone's trying to say something and you have one facilitator. So I just went, you know, onto uh, Slack and said, hey, do you want me to say something, you know, that about this and this? That was yep. worth the whole podcast right there is your tips on how to use Slack or chat to uh, to do the meeting beside the meeting right during the meeting. I love that. That's the first time I've heard that. Well, Tiffany, thank you so much for your time today. Valuable tips, practical tips, real world from uh, one of my favorite leaders. Uh, I was going to say in tech, woman leaders in tech, you're one of my favorite leaders, period. So Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight and your passion. You are a terrific role model. No, oh, Bonnie, thank you. Look, I, you know, I, I appreciate you and everything that you do and you're an inspiration to me. So it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Terrific. Keep doing what you're doing, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you.